me to Michigan, and I was reminded, having spent a week there, how much they love their college football. They are really, really into it. Michigan Wolverine stuff was everywhere, flags draped over homes, you know, cars with stickers all over them, people wearing jerseys. Uh, they were really into it. And then I also learned afresh, I had heard about it, but I, I heard that palpable expectation they have about the big game, they call it, the big game between the Wolverines and Ohio State. And they have been keeping track for 114 years now as to what's going on in that game. And it's coming up in a couple of weeks here in November again. That'll be the 115th time. And they are serious about that game. And I can only imagine, can you picture being in the, in the, the locker room and hearing that, that, that coach just those last few minutes before they go through that tunnel onto that field to play that game. They must be as geared up at that moment. You know, it's, that's got to be the height of their preparation. Well, they were lacking that preparation about 11 years ago when uh, they had a great team assembled. And they had uh, just all the analysts saying they're not only going to win the Big Ten, they're going to go all the way. This is going to be the year for them, 2007. And uh, they started their season with a, a team and I don't mean to make fun of them just by saying it, but Appalachian State. I, I don't know what you picture. I guess that's a West Coast thing. But I'm thinking, you know, nothing against Boone, you know, North Carolina. But uh, it was no big deal. I mean, they were starting their schedule so simply. And, and, and you know, those boys from Appalachian State, I, they, they were really no match for Michigan that year. And yet, uh, maybe some of you know sports history well enough to know that that is hailed as the biggest college football upset in history. Michigan went down, Appalachian State was just euphoric over their win, and uh, I'll tell you, whatever was missing in terms of the prep and the ferocity and just that fortitude to say, we're going to go out there and play this game as though we're playing Ohio State, they didn't have that that day, and it showed, and they lost, and they lost big. Now, uh, I don't know anything about really their mindset as they went onto the gridiron that day, but I do know about another battle that took place. It was in the Valley of Elah, and there was a great deal of confidence and fortitude. There was a sense in which there was uh, kind of the sense they were, they were the guys. The, the Philistines were the army to beat, and their quarterback that year uh, was as good as any, right, Goliath. And I'll tell you, though they had had a lot of ferocity in the past, they stood there in the Valley of Elah, and I would certainly say, from God's perspective, here was a uh, overweening confidence in the fact that these useless Israelites that stood across on the other side of this valley, uh, they were really no match, particularly when he kept calling out for the biggest warrior to come out to fight him. And you know the story, of course. Here stands David, wouldn't even get into the armor. It didn't work, didn't fit. He stood there with a slingshot. And you remember how Goliath mocked David there. I mean, you're coming against me with, like, with, with sticks, a little boy, a little shepherd boy. This is, uh, this is absurd. And there's no possible way as David approached the great Goliath, that Goliath had any doubt that he was going to win that day. Now, I suppose when David and Goliath is brought up all throughout uh, Houston this morning, as it's alluded to in pulpits, most pastors want to slip you into the sandals of David, right? That's an inspiring thing. It's even become a, an idiom in our culture, right? The David and Goliath, the, the, the ultimate, you know, just get out there and know you think you're not going to win, go do it. And, and yet, I think we would learn a lot more this morning to put ourselves in the giant sandals of Goliath. Because there's a lesson there to learn. Like uh, the University of Michigan going out on a field thinking, we got this. We got this. And we can sing songs, and we do in their triumphant songs. We talk about the Lord of hosts. We talk about our holy God. We know he's called us to be holy like he is holy. We realize the process of sanctification. We get together in church, and particularly on a Sunday morning, it's, it's something to think, hey, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, from here until the time I cross the threshold into the kingdom and I can see my Christian sanctification just continuing to rise. It, this is going to work. We got this. But I'll tell you what, it's that overweening confidence that sometimes is the biggest foil for our progress in our Christian life. You know, in the upper room, I don't know how you envision that, probably not da Vinci's uh, sketch of it all, but you, you picture, if you know your Bible, a bunch of guys that you don't think in the night before the crucifixion that you're going to see them as overconfident. Especially after Jesus said in the upper room, you know, one of the 12 here is going to betray me. Can you imagine the shiver down your spine when you're thinking that? I mean, they didn't suspect Judas, of course. You know that if you've studied that scene. And, and they're all sitting there, and it says that they're asking each other, 
in, in, in Luke chapter 14, verse 23, it, wonder who it is. Is it me? Is it you? Who is it? They're wondering. And you think that'd be a time for incredible humility to think one of you is going to become the agency for the betrayal of the Son of Man, that Daniel 7 figure, this great one to whom all authority should be, and he is going to be taken down, at least humanly speaking, put on a Roman execution rack because somebody in that inner circle was going to betray him. But if you know what's going on in Luke chapter 22, what happens is that uh, they break out into an argument about who's the greatest among them. I, mean, I know we read it one sentence after the next and we think about, okay, someone here is going to betray me and they're going, I wonder who it is, who it is. And I'm thinking, is there any sense in which you think it's me? Is it me? And they end up kind of comparing resumes. Wow, I don't think it's going to be me. I mean, I, I, matter of fact, I, I've watched how you deal with situations. I, I deal, here they are arguing about who is the strongest and the greatest. And so Jesus steps into the scene. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn there in Luke chapter 22. And he says in verse Number 31, to the man who would be the quarterback of the early church, humanly speaking, the first senior preaching pastor of the mega church of Jerusalem, 3,000, soon 5,000, and that's just the men in that company. I mean, you've got a picture of 10,000 people meeting there and Peter standing up with a booming voice and preaching to them. That is what is on the future for Peter, and yet him in this scene... I'm sure, as you look up there with that discussion about who the greatest is, I, I'm sure Peter was, was just in there with the rest of them. Maybe, as you know Peter from your studies of the Gospels, you think he's leading that discussion. I, I know I'm the greatest here. And yet Jesus says, what you need is a real dose of humility, and there wasn't a lot of it going on in that scene. And so Jesus speaks to Peter, and I think he speaks to all of us here this morning, particularly when we think about the battle that we face, the battle for our sanctification, the impulses, the desires of our flesh wage war against our soul. If you're a Christian, you've resonated with anything that you've sung this morning or heard in preaching. If you were part of this conference this weekend, you know God is holy and you know he's called us to holiness. And you've got to realize when it comes down to it and you think about this battle, it is going to be a struggle and there's a great deal of humility that we need in this process. And Jesus is about to inject a whole bunch of it here. We're just going to study four verses, 31 through 34, but follow along as I read it for you from the English Standard Version. Jesus says, Simon, Simon. Even there is a bit of a wake-up call, right? That's not what he normally calls him. He changed his name. It's Peter, but now we're back to the old name, Simon. Behold, Satan has demanded to have y'all. I can't say that in California and anybody understand what I'm saying, but you get it here, right? Unfortunately, in English, we don't have that uh, second person plural pronoun. And if you're in Alabama, I guess it's all y'all. It just becomes, you know, everyone out there. So it's not you, which is interesting because he says to Peter, that's an individual. And I hope this sermon this morning goes to you, an individual, and you realize this is a statement about all y'all. Satan has demanded to have you. I mean, there's that picture of Job, right? I, there's one. God says, that's my man right there, Job. And Satan goes, let me at him. I want to have him. And then it says, very interesting phrase here, that he might sift you like wheat. Now, commentators struggle with this because the only time we see this word in the New Testament, sift, and, you know, it's hard to figure out exactly what's in view here, but I know it's not good, right? Are you with me on that? Whatever this is, I don't want to be sifted, certainly not by Satan. <laughs> sifted. Kind of like what you might imagine. It's not a pastoral scene out there in a, an agrarian culture, kind of throwing up the, the wheat on Aruna's threshing floor and seeing the chaff separated from the wheat. I mean, this is something like grinding and, and putting you through the ringer, as we might say in the idioms of English today. Satan wants to tear you apart. And again, it's you, y'all, all of you. There's already been one taken down. Beginning of this chapter, we have Judas, right? And Satan has already entered him as he goes out to make a deal to betray Christ. And now he turns to Simon, the future preacher, the senior pastor at the church in Jerusalem. He says, you know what? Satan wants to have you all. He wants to just sift you all like wheat. But I've prayed for, and we don't get this in English either, but we shift from a plural pronoun to a singular pronoun. I prayed for you, Peter. I prayed for you. 
that your faith, your trust, your confidence may not fail. And when you've turned again, which is built into what he's about to say in verses 33 and 34, you're going to stumble. Man, Satan's going to get a piece of you. You are going to go through something here. But when you've turned again and you get back to where you need to be, and here's the message I spoke yesterday, strengthen your brothers, care about the holiness of this team, care about your spiritual health, care about being the kinds of people that you're supposed to be assigned to the work I've called you to be, fishers of men. Man, strengthen your brothers. They're going to need you out there. And Peter said, this is the caricature of Peter we all know, right? Lord, hey, what are you talking about? Talking to me? Did you not hear our discussion earlier about resume comparisons here? I'm doing pretty good. I mean, I'm not like Thomas or Philip, Nathaniel. I mean, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. They can pull my limbs off of my body. I am there for you. I don't know what you're talking about, turning again like I'm going to stumble. Satan, bring it on, man. No big deal. And Jesus says... You can sense the somber tone. I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. That's big. Talk about denial. You won't even say you know me, let alone be loyal to me. You're going to treat me like a stranger. Now, the drama of this night, of course, it starts with the upper room and the institution of the Lord's Supper, and there's going to be all this that goes on. The preliminary hearings with Annas and Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin at dawn and all that goes on after this. But it is starting here with a sober reminder. Hey, Peter, Satan wants to get all you guys. I'm praying for you in particular. And I want you, when you've turned back, after you stumble and fall on your face, I need you to get up and I need you to strengthen your brothers because we need each other. There's a battle for holiness in the church And it starts with recognizing that there is a battle. Now, I'd like to start here at the bottom of the passage. Three simple observations this morning, verses 33 and 34. Can we look at this? Because this is the most prominent thing that we gather from this passage when we read it, and that is that Peter sure felt like he didn't have any problems when it came to his strength spiritually, right? Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go both to prison and to death, right? And Jesus has to say, no, 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 that's not it. You don't realize. You don't realize your weakness. You're not even going to get through the night, By the time morning comes and on the dawn, you you hear roosters crowing, that's, you're already going to have denied me three times. You're going to fail big time. If you're taking notes, might not be a bad idea this morning. Number one, you ought to jot this down. We should connect with Peter in this regard. Number one, we ought to be mindful of our weakness. Mindful of our weakness. And I know that you chide him in your mind when you read that, hey, I'm ready to go to prison and death with you. And you go, oh, Peter, 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 Peter. That's such a silly thing. should never say that. Now, before you go, Peter, 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 you never should have said that. I don't think you have the same mindset when you read in Acts 21, Paul say almost the identical same thing, right? You don't go, oh, Paul, Paul, Paul. When Paul says in that passage, this is verse 13, I'm ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of Jesus Christ. And you go, yeah, get him, because you know what happens, right? He does. He ends up getting arrested heading to Caesarea, in prison for a while, appeals to Caesar, off to Rome, gets released for a while, ends up coming back in prison and then executed, and we know he dies as a martyr valiantly, and we say, yeah, Paul, and you love that resolve. See, this passage is not about you not being resolved to follow Christ. God loves the fact that his people be resolved to follow Christ. I mean, we're all about biblical resolves. The scripture is so clear. But way back to the verses you learned as a little kid in church in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, be strong and courageous. Don't be frightened. Don't be dismayed. We're not supposed to sit there like trembling people. We're supposed to be dedicated and committed, as that passage says, because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. We need to be in that locker room banging our helmet on the, on the, on the lockers going, we're ready, let's get out there. It's not about the resolve to follow Christ faithfully, even unto death. That would be a good thing, and it's lacking in our day. People don't like commitment. They don't like resolve. We should get back to that. You're all for weddings, right? Are you in, you're, good, you're still good with weddings, at least in, Cal, you know, in Texas you ought to be, I would think. And you get up here on this platform, and you watch these folks as your eyes get up here, and you love it when they say, I promise, I promise, I'll be faithful to you till death do us part, right? sickness and in health, better work. You love that. You, oh, that's wonderful. But you know in this scene, you've got Peter basically doing that, and by the time he gets to the parking lot, before he can leave the campus after the reception, he's saying, that woman, I don't don't even know her. I don't even know her. (laughs) This is a terrible fall on his face. 
But don't you want him to be, I mean, you're going to cheer him on. Say it. Say you love her. That's what you want. What you hate is the denial in the parking lot. Now, when Paul got up on stage, stage and said, I will follow Christ, I will go to prison, I will go to death, you go, yay, because you know he goes out there in the parking lot and when it mattered whether it was Festus or Felix or King Agrippa, he was, he was there, he was ready, he was strong. And we love that and we should because the Bible calls us to that. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, I love it, verse 13, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. Don't be like a little junior high girl. The man of the home, go into that dark room, go into that home, go in that back alley, lead your family, be strong, and you ought to step up, and you ought to feel that, and you ought to be resolved for that. That's a great thing, but you ought to be, and I made you write it down, be mindful of your weakness. Now, it's, I know it's an overused, trite phrase, but it's not a bad one. When you hear of the next Christian who seemed to be going so well in his Christian faith, and everyone thought he or she was doing so well, and they fall into some kind of sin and they do deny their Lord in some way. Not a bad thing to say, there but for the grace of God go I. Why? Because you've got the same stuff in your life that is waging war against your soul that was waging war against their soul that caused them to fall flat on their face in the parking lot and say, I don't even know this woman. you got the same stuff, right? I talk about this all the time. And it may be an oversimplification, but we are software, right? We are software. When you see someone die, that, that spirit is gone, right? Every single cell of that body is still there, encased in that body. And when we become Christians, the Bible says something interior in our lives changes. Not only does the Holy Spirit invade our lives, but our heart of stone that's dead to God becomes alive to God. It beats in sync with God. It loves and delights in the law of the Lord. That is who we are. This is called the miracle of regeneration. But what we often miss is something that is attached to to the hardware of our bodies, and that's something, I guess, in our computer world we can say is the firmware of our lives. And that firmware that makes us alive, it's living. And really, there's a firmware in everything that is animated that God gives life to, whether it's a kangaroo or a cockroach, God gives that animate stuff life. And we as human beings are given life. But we're made of the dust of the earth as God breathes life into Adam as that prototype of the creation, and we see there that Men are not only software, they're hardware. That hardware and what drives that animated force is fallen. I mean, everything from the physical components, the carbon, the phosphorus, just everything that's involved in the dirt of the earth that makes up a human being is now cursed. It's why we have cancer. It's why we have disease. It's why people die. But there's something about the firmware. Even if you change the system out and the software gets changed, that firmware keeps messing things up. That, that software cannot function the way that it wants to because there's this constant battle. You're going to have hardware again that's going to be glorified and the firmware is going to work perfectly in sync harmoniously with the software. But you have right now this fallen humanity and it, it constantly grates against every good intention you have. You have every intention this week to stand up for Christ, don't you? In the lunchroom, when they're bringing up something that disparages your Savior, don't you right now intend as you walk out of the doors of this auditorium say, I want to stand up for Christ? When they tell me to sit down, I want to stand up. When they say, shut up, I want to speak out. I want to stand firmly without any fear against a world that is continuing to encroach upon our convictions and our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Even if it costs us imprisonment or even death, we should all want to say that. But we know this, we're incredibly weak, aren't we? In that there's something in my, my, my firmware, something that is an impulse of my fallen humanity that wants to say, Mike, don't speak up now. Is it really? I don't, I don't want to be be outed as a Jesus freak, not in this setting. I mean, my hair cutter really thinks I'm cool at this point. They don't know I'm a, I'm a pastor. Just shut up, right? Don't stand up for what's right here. I mean, these are the kinds of things that every single person deals with, not only in the sins of omission, but the sins of commission. There's a constant push in my life and in your life to do the very things that make us gasp when we hear of some Christian that's fallen on their face. We fight those things. We don't even get out of the chapter. You got the Bible open there? Drop, drop down to verse 54. This is where it all happens. It unfolds. They seize him. That is Jesus. Verse 54, Luke 22. They seize him and they lead him away, bringing him to the high priest's house. That's Caiaphas. Peter was following at a distance, and when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, they sat down together, and Peter sat down among them. 
By the way, look at verse 54 again. Peter was following side by side. No, Peter was following locked arms with Christ, following at a distance. There's always a pattern and a process in this, isn't there? And we slowly give way to the compromises of our flesh. We slowly find our way into the place where we used to speak up for Christ and now half my neighbors don't even know I'm a Christian. That slowly seems to happen. And, and Peter was following at a distance and now as he sits here, just takes, it, all it takes is a servant girl in verse 56. Sees him in the light, looking at him closely, going, wow, wait a minute, I think I recognize that guy. There was a big crowd that came to the Garden of Gethsemane and arrested Jesus. There were all kinds of it, probably a servant girl there as a part of this crowd from the high priest's entourage. And she says, I think I recognize that guy. But he denied it. He said, woman, I don't know him. Wow. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, hey, you're also one of them. And he said, man, I am not. Now listen, if I denied my, my, my bride, my newlywed bride, twice in the parking lot of the church, just after I got married, I'm thinking maybe an hour is going to solve the problem. Look at verse 59. It's interesting that Luke would add this. And after an interval of about an hour, I got a chance to feel guilty already, right? I'm thinking, time for me to get back on the horse. I'm going to stand up this time. If anyone else asks me, As you can imagine, Peter looking from a distance across this large courtyard with tears in his eyes, thinking, this is the end for Christ. I mean, they were already starting to mock him. They might have already started to physically assault him at this point. And then he gets a third opportunity. Hey, strong man, Peter, Peter, the Peter that said, I'll go to prison, I'll die with you. They said, certainly this man was also with him, for he too is a Galilean. Parallel passages, of course, tell us, Matthew 26, Mark 14, it was because they heard his accent. You're, for, you're a northerner. We know, yeah, you, yeah, you're with them. That's where Jesus did all that ministry. You're, you're one of his guys. And Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. Of course he knows what he's talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. That internal battle, have you felt that? Of course you have, unless you're not saved. If you're a real Christian, you know that battle. You feel it every week. And that's the battle that is inevitably going to lead us into some compromises that I know this is nothing new. As a matter of fact, look at the next, the next passage here. It says, immediately he's speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. I mean, I don't know. You can picture several directors have tried to depict this in these Jesus movies, right? But somehow from a distance, Jesus is like, can't even hear the conversation, but he turns in his omniscience and looks over. And that had to be like daggers for Peter, right? At least at this point, he's getting it. He remembered the saying of the Lord and how he'd said before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. I don't think you're a Christian here this morning unless you haven't had that experience. Have you wept bitterly over your sin as a Christian? And you recognize, man, I'm weaker than I thought I was. Especially as a new Christian, they get out there, they go, I'm going to live for Christ. I get it. This is easy. I get it. Got a great church. I got it. Every single person in this room is vulnerable. We have an enemy within. Our humanity is fighting. And I know you got plans to be useful for the Lord. Some of you are rising in leadership in this church. You could be another story we tell around the dinner table about a Christian that's wiped out. You just got to have that sense of humility. You got to know your weakness. Remember your vulnerability. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, don't turn there, but it reminds us of that generation that was wandering in the wilderness. And I'm thinking if anyone should know, I'm going to be faithful to the Lord. It's people that are seeing his miracles firsthand. You got Moses as your pastor. Think about that. I mean, he's just done miracles. I mean, at, at the tip of his staff, there were the 10 plagues taking place. I mean, come on. The Red Sea parted. You're getting your, your, your Pop-Tarts off the lawn in the morning, right? Manna. It's, it's like you, you get breakfast delivered to you every day. And then you complain about meat and, and, and quail come and dump themselves in your backyard. This is an amazing time. Pillar of fire, pillar of smoke leading you. And yet the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, they sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. 
and 23,000 of them fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did. They were destroyed by serpents. Don't grumble as some of them did. They were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, these things happened to them because they were terrible, awful people. No. These things happened to them as an example to us. They were written down for our instruction. Why? I know you know this verse. Verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 10. Therefore, let anyone thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. They've seen way more miracles than you have. They've had more of the authenticity, of the veracity of God's truth given to them than we've ever had. And they sat there, and if there was a Wi-Fi connection in the desert, they'd be watching porn. They would be sleeping with their neighbor's wife. They didn't wake up in the morning and say, how can we serve the Lord? They said, how can we go out and just have fun today? I just want to have a good time. I just want to feel good. This was God's people isolated from the nations. They're, They're nomads. And the Bible says if they can fall like that, just like I hope those stories you hear of Christians that are fallen, it should send a a shiver up your spine and say, wow, there but for the grace of God go I. If you're not there, and some of us have had experiences, of course, where we wept bitterly over our sin. But if you're not yet a statistic, man, oh, fantastic. God, thank you. By your grace, I've been able to stand to the extent that I have been able to stand. And the next verse just encourages us. You memorize this as a kid. I hope if you grew up in church, no temptation is overtaking you except that which is common to man. Every single battle you face, everyone in this room is facing one way or another. We have our own versions of them. But the basic problem with our firmware that is just jamming itself against our software that wants to serve and please the Lord. It's, we all have the same temp- kinds of temptations. God's faithful, though. He's not going to allow you to be tempted beyond your ability. Here's the hope held out for us. But with the temptation, he'll provide a way of escape so that we'll be able to coast through it. No, endure it. It's going to be hard. But you've got to know your weakness. It's good for us to have the dose of humility that Peter was missing. And it starts with being mindful of our weakness. Go back up to verse 31, if you're still there in Luke 22. And I want to think of why. This is happening as often as it is. Is it just because we have weak hardware with this violent software trying to foil the software of our, or the firmware that's trying to foil the software of our spirit? No, more than that. We've got an external force, not just an internal enemy. We've got an external enemy. Verse 31, Jesus has to say to Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan, right? The adversary, he's your opponent. He wants to sift you. Right? He wants to sift you like wheat. And it's not just Peter, it's everyone. And that's a good thing for us to put our arms around each other and know this is a battle we are all facing. The battle for holiness in this church is one that Satan wants to take you. Do you think Satan cares more about this church than the church down the street that's fully entrenched in its heresy? And I don't mean that literally because I don't know which church is down the street, but I'm just saying <laughs> the church down the street, quote unquote. Do you think Satan is, uh, Satan's got his feet up down there, right? I know this. Right? This church believes in the right stuff. This church is committed to the right gospel. This church has a high view of God. This church understands what expository preaching is supposed to be. This is a dangerous church for the enemy. And you don't think you're under attack? If you are taking notes, not only do you, not, not only do you need to be mindful of our weakness, number two, you need to consider the forces against us, the spiritual forces of darkness in, in heavenly places. There's cosmic battle going on. Yeah, we have a weakness, and Satan wants to exploit it. I talk about Job, right? And how great would it be for you after this day is over to have God say, you please me, well done, good and faithful servant. I want to please the Lord more and more, First Thess 4. I want that. I just don't want God bringing it up in a boardroom meeting where Satan is there, right? Because that was a bad day for Job. And here is God. He lets the leash out a little on the enemy, and he goes after Job. Well, he's letting the leash out. On Peter, and you think, God, why do you do that? Well, that's for another sermon why God does that. Not that his inscrutable ways can always be explained in a five point outline, but I can tell you this he does it. Am I right? He allows the enemy to attack us. He's the accuser of the brethren, and he's going after us, and he wants to exploit your weakness, and he wants to exploit the weakness of the people in this church, and I would venture to say more than the average church. So be on guard. Understand the battle. No one is more vulnerable in a battle than the person who doesn't know the battle's going on, right? You got to know. And you've got your feet up here. While Satan has his head down here, you're in trouble. You can sing great songs about the victory of Christ, but the battle 
that we're facing is waging right now. Pull together these two truths. Peter was the one who fell flat on his face, and later he wrote these words. Be sober-minded and watchful. Your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That means more when you know a little biblical history, right? When Jesus looked Peter in the eyes and said, Satan wants y'all. He wants to have you all, and he wants to sift you all like wheat. And then Satan got a hold of his backside and took a big bite out of him and took him down. And Peter writes the people he loves, as we ought to be encouraging each other and saying this, whatever victorious plastic view of Christianity you might have that we're on cruise control till we get to the kingdom, you need to read these words. Be sober and mindful, watchful. Your adversary, the devil's like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood in Orange County, in Oregon State, in Washington, in Florida. It's going on all over the place. But you've got this responsibility here. This is your church. Consider the forces against you. It's going to be a dark, dark trail to get to the kingdom. Through many tribulations, Jesus, or Peter rather, or Paul rather, was try, trying to strengthen the churches as he goes back on another journey and he says through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God if I were to take you and say hey I got a great beach house for you it's down uh, you know in Orange County and I'm going to take you to it. it's great it'll be wonderful it'll be awesome but we're going to get there after a flight that's late and uh, it's like one of the beaches if you know our beaches like uh, a lot of them have long steps we have one beach called Thousand Steps where you go from the road and PCH all the way down to the beach and just like an endless you know it's not a thousand steps it's less than that we call it a thousand steps because we're given to exaggeration but it's thousand steps speech we call it and and if you were to do that at night even in the daytime it's kind of creepy but if I brought you to the beach you've never ever been to the Pacific coast I say come on over we're going to go to this beach there's a great beach house down on the beach it's wonderful provided the the refrigerator stock the cupboards are stocked we're going to hang out it's going to be a great night you will love it there but we got to first go down those thousand steps Oh, and by the way, as you bring your family with you to kind of enjoy this beach condo I'm going to let you use, uh, just know there's beasts that live in those, uh, in those bushes, and they, they eat children. <laughs> they ate like 10 children last month, so I bet you'd hold your children tightly. You would walk down that beach path with a great deal of vigilance. Perhaps you would be sober-minded and watchful knowing you've got an adversary that wants to devour you. And I know you think, well, I'm just kicking back. I mean, you know, there are superstars in our church. I'm just not one of them. I just want to keep my nose clean. I just like to get to heaven without any big marks against me. Baron Trump. Maybe this will help. Baron Trump. I don't think he's written a position paper on anything. I don't know his views on the caravan down in Honduras. I, I, don't, I don't think he's ever debated anybody politically. I mean, there's really no reason for these hostile, angry liberals to go after Baron Trump, right? But they do. Peter Fonda, did you read months back what he wrote about Baron Trump? He said, Baron Trump ought to be locked in a cage with a bunch of pedophiles. That's what, that's what Peter Fonda said. One of the, one, one of the uh, supposed comedy writers of Saturday Night Live, the SNL writer, wrote this, Baron Trump, yes, he said, he will be our next mass murderer. Now, what if they wrote in the paper about your son? He's 12 years old. He's going to be a mass murderer. I think you'd say, what in the world did my son do to you? And what is the answer? Nothing. What did Baron Trump ever do to the people that every single day, sometimes the celebrities say it, sometimes the powerful say it, and it makes the news, but it happens every single day. The trolls on, on Twitter every day will rip that kid up one side and down the other. Why? Because they hate his dad. That's the only reason. The spiritual battle you think you're going to bypass because you're not a traveling preacher or you're not some kind of Bible translator or you're not a Sunday school teacher in your church, it'll be fine. I'm just going to lay low. Well, Baron Trump can't lay low, am I right? They will go after him. Do you think he goes anywhere? Do you think, do you think mom and dad let him go anywhere without protection? Not a chance. Do you know how vicious our enemy is? I, mean, I hope it's with great grief and tears that you talk about the people that the roaring, roaring lion, our adversary, has taken down. You just hate that. 
But if you think you're going to avoid it because you're not a high-profile Christian, you're wrong. I know we don't have time for this, but that rarely stops me. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6. As you turn to Ephesians 6, a classic text, I just want to let you know again, the great combination here of humility, because we know our weakness, and yet resolve and fortitude. We want to serve the Lord. We want to be faithful. We want our churches to be holy. Look at this, verse 10, Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. That's a hopeful, optimistic statement, isn't it? We don't wrestle against f flesh and blood. I've already covered that, right? Against rulers and authorities and cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. That's what we're preaching about this weekend. We want to reflect the holiness of our holy God in progressive ways, continue to move toward increasing forever and continually conform to one image of Christ to the next level of glory. We want to be Christ-like. Take up the armor of God that you can stand, withstand the evil of having done everything to stand firm. And then it gets into that list. My dad was a Long Beach cop, retired now, obviously, but uh, back in the day, I'll never forget him coming home from work. And we lived in, you know, L.A. County, and uh, it wasn't a great place that he worked every day. And I remember the first Velcro thing ever in our house, right? I remember that sound. The first time you ever hear Velcro ripping off, you know? It was my dad's Kevlar vest, his bulletproof vest. And he'd come home off his motorcycle, his uh, police motorcycle, and he would come in, and my dad, you know, darkened by the sun, and, and, and he'd take off his, his uniform and put his badge down on the counter, and he would drive his, his police vehicle home, and then he'd take that vest, and I remember him just <laughs> ripping that off, laying that on the bed. And I'd see his white T-shirt just drenched with sweat. He'd take out his 357 Magnum, nickel-plated 357 Smith & Wesson on the counter. And he'd reach down into his ankle holster and pull out his little stub nose, 38. And then he'd have his knife over on this side. And, I mean, it's full of weapons everywhere. And I'll tell you what, though, as a little kid watching my dad come home, and this is before, you know, all the Internet news, but I had enough news. We read the paper every day. My mom would have her little scanner on her bed there, and we'd listen to the calls going out and the riots going on and the problems and the, the, the stuff going on. We, we, we were concerned about Dad. And, you know, I was so glad at least. It gave me some comfort to know that Dad at least was, he, he was armored up. He had his tools be terrible for my dad to drive into the driveway with a tank top and shorts on right like what are you doing you better be ready god calls us to put on some things verse 14 belt of truth you better be able to discern what is true some of you have told me and i love getting to know some of you that you're new to this church and the truth you're starting to discern it in a way you never have man that you are that you you're behind get with it double time I mean, it isn't seventh graders telling me that. You're starting to learn the truth, discern the truth, you know the truth. Man, put, you got to strap that belt of truth on. Put on that breastplate of righteousness, though I'm all about the imputed righteousness of Christ. I don't think that's what's in view here. I think this is the best defense is a good offense. You need to be known for righteous deeds. You need to be zealous for good works. I'm talking about imputed righteousness. Let's get into verse 15 then. But there is those shoes for our feet, the stability that we have, having the readiness given by the gospel of grace. We are now situated because Christ has made us righteous. We stand clothed in Christ. That's another aspect of our preparation. Clearly, that's the starting point. It's the shoes. It's the foundation. And in all circumstances, you better have that shield of faith. And you know what? We live in a day, I was talking about it with uh, Kelly, the elder of our church here and we live in a visceral society, an emotional society, an emotive society, a lot of misplaced compassion. We have policy being built on how people feel about things. Right? Faith is 
trust and confidence in the truth despite your feelings, despite what you might be feeling in your tummy. This is about being confident in what God has said regardless of what's going on. We need to have faith, a shield of faith. And you can extinguish all kinds of flaming darts of the evil one with that. And the helmet of your salvation, I love that. The helmet of your salvation. I know we always like to think about salvation as something that's secured now in our lives, something that was accomplished in the past historically on the cross, and all that's true. But so much of the New Testament looks to salvation in the future. And I think the helmet I have, the thing that keeps my head straight in this world, is the fact that I know we win. I will be saved. I know I'm justified right now, declared righteous in Christ. And I know it's based on historical, the salvation secured on the cross. But the thing that keeps me moving forward, I can take a lot of rocks to the skull as long as I know we're winning. We're winning. We're going to win this. I'm going to walk through the gates of the new Jerusalem. We'll see how the Bema seat pans out. But there's no condemnation for me in Christ. And the sword of the Spirit, I know that's why you're in this church, isn't it? Unless you just stumbled in today. You're going to stay because you love the word of God. Learn to wield it well. Be in it. Were you in it this morning? Were you in it last night? Are you memorizing it, meditating on it? Are you talking about it? Praying at all times. This one doesn't get a correspondence to the armor of the Roman soldier, but man, you ought to have your life saturated in prayer. I I could preach on that and quickly get us to all feel guilty about our prayer lives, and we need sermons like that because we got to pray more than we pray giving ourselves to prayer at all times in the spirit and that's not some emotional euphoric experience in the spirit means that god's spirit wrote a book right and that book tells us how to that's the tracks on which we run my prayer request should go right there in the spirit right in keeping with what i think the spirit's gonna go yep that's it yep with all prayer and supplication To that end, keep alert. Now, this is a great passage. We do not read this in context enough in terms of the war that we're facing. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication, not just for yourself. This is the battle for holiness, not for you as a person, because if you're the only person that makes it in this church with a kind of progressive, growing, strong sanctification and everyone else around you fails, this isn't going to be a good experience for your Christian life. Make prayer, that kind of fervent prayer and supplication for all the saints. Consider the forces against you. This is a spiritual battle. Strap on the armor and get ready for this. Let's wrap this up with verse 32, back to our text, Luke 22. The most encouraging thing about our passage, that's why I wanted to end with this, verse 32, but I have prayed for you. I prayed for you. Yeah, you got a responsibility. You're going to be an important player in teaching the church. You are going to be a key figure in the book of Acts, the first half of the book of Acts. You're going to be the key figure. But Satan wants to take you out, you along with everyone else. But I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned, I need you to be strong because you got to strengthen your brothers. I need you to be whole. I need you to turn back. I need you to be back on the beam and I need you to get back on the beam soon because you need to strengthen your brother. You're going to be the source of strength for others. And we don't see this in our English text, but verse 32, I have prayed for you. The majority of times we see the word prayer in scripture. It's the common word for prayer. Some of the old translations, sometimes when we got into this Greek word, deomai, we had the word beseech. It was a much stronger old English word, but you need to know that's the the minority word that's translated prayer in the Greek New Testament, and that's a word for that strong, just God's fervent prayer for you. If you're taking notes, not only do you need to be mindful of our weakness, consider the spiritual forces against this. Number three, jot this down. You need to put confidence in the right place. Confidence in the right place that Christ is begging on your behalf. He is interceding for you. You need to be grateful that's true for you, singular. There's a lot of people, including spiritual forces, that want to condemn us. But as Romans 8.34 says, who is there really to condemn us? And I'm going to say i got a long line of people. But really the one that matters is Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is the one who died for me. More than that, he was raised, and he's at the right hand of God. Indeed, he is interceding for us. If I get in trouble this afternoon... Of course, the things in Scripture, as it says in 1 John, they're written, so I would not sin. But if I do sin, I have got an attorney. I've got an advocate with the Father. I'm not going to abuse that grace. It's not a license to sin. But man, it's good to know if all the things I've said about falling on your face and denying your Lord and the, wit- the bitter weeping, if that just hurts, then here's some great news. You know, you can get off your face and back on the beam 
because you've got an attorney that is ready to pick you up and say, this is mine, this is my guy, this is my gal, and before the Father, you're, you will still stand 100% accepted before him. Have you displeased the Lord this week? Sure. Do we want to please him next week more than we please him this week? Yes. But you've got an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he can point back to the cross and say every single condemning reason to put Mike Fabar's down and out, I dealt with that on the cross. What great words this morning from Bruce about a specific forgiveness for specific sins. Was that, if you missed that, you got to go back and stream that sermon. What joy we should have that we have an attorney, an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, who's interceding for us. And I know in Romans, I, I just quoted Romans 8.34, but earlier in that passage, it says not only is the second person of the Godhead interceding for us, it says the Spirit in verse 26, He knows our weakness. And that's good to know because we're supposed to remember that this morning in the sermon. And He knows that we're not praying as we ought to pray, but the Spirit Himself, the third person of the Godhead, He's interceding for us. And He's groaning the way creation is groaning, and that is, I can't wait for this to be over. I can't wait for all that's wrong to be made right. He can't wait for that. Just like we groan within ourselves, the Spirit's groaning, come on! Mm. And he wants you and I to walk in holiness this week. Put your confidence in the right place. How good this must have been when it finally sunk into Peter's mind. Jesus was very clear, I'm going to turn again. It's not if you turn again, strengthen your brothers. Look at verse 32, when you've turned again. I'm praying for you. Your faith is going to make it through this trial. You're going to deny me. I mean, clearly, Jesus could see it with some servant girl. Who knows? Maybe a 16-year-old servant girl. And yet, you're going to turn back. And when you do, you've got some work to do. We've got to strengthen the brothers when you've turned. That wasn't easy for Peter. I think he's a lot like us. Hard for us to look in the mirror when we've stumbled John 21, you have to turn there real quick. John 21. If you stumbled, I'd be remiss to cut this out. This is the rest of the story. When you've turned again, when you've turned back, this is when Peter finally got it. Talk about being sifted like wheat. He, he was like the chaff. He was running away. I mean, here we are in Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias, when he's supposed to be soon in Jerusalem preaching fishing for men in Jerusalem, and yet he's fishing for fish again. Look at verse 3. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing, which reminds you, by the way, speaking of the corporate nature of our compromise, or you're taking a long time to get back on the beam. It says in verse 2, you got Thomas, Nathaniel, sons of Zebedee, right? James and John, other disciples. Peter's a natural leader, and they're going, oh, we're going to go too. They said, we'll go with you, verse 3. Don't take another day. There you're running from God. You're involved in something. Get it fixed. Let's today, let's turn again so we can strengthen our brothers. It's, we, it's too, too important for us. As I said last night, too important for us not to be helping each other spiritually. Verse 4, as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples didn't know it was Jesus. You can imagine this. Early morning. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, Nope. And he said, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast, they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. And if you think, wow, I think, where is that? That's a deja vu moment. That's an intentional deja vu moment for them. Luke chapter 5, that's how this all started. Cast your net on the other side. You'll get to catch a fish. Here is the Lord of all things directing fish into the nets. I can put the fish wherever I want them. And here it is again. Man, that takes him back to the beginning. That's when he fell down. I'm a sinful man. And now, oh, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's the way John liked to talk about himself, said to Peter, hey, it's the Lord. Simon Peter heard it was the Lord. He put on his outer garment. He stripped for work. He threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the full, the net full of fish. They weren't far from the land, about 100 yards off. And when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire underline that it's interesting it's a lot of interesting and rare words in our passage today demanded is one of them 
Satan demanded, that's only one time used in the New Testament. Sifted, that's one time used in the New Testament. Here's one that's only used twice. Charcoal fire. You know the other time it's used? It's in John 18, 18, when John is describing the fire in Caiaphas' courtyard. Only other time we see charcoal fire. And isn't it interesting that here is Jesus, like a surgeon, and there's not a lot of anesthetic here. We're starting with, hey, remember how you started to follow me? Let's start with that whole thing again. Net on the other side of the boat. Fire, remember when you, in the glow of the fire, said you don't know me? Let's start another charcoal fire here. And this early morning, time for you to think about what you've done. It's time to get back on the beam. That charcoal fire was in place, and fish was laid out on it. Didn't even need the 153 fish they had just caught. And they had bread as well, and Jesus said, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. And so Simon went aboard and hauled the net ashore, large fish, 153. Why did they count them? I don't know. Different sermon, a lot of speculation. And although there were so many, the net was not torn, and Jesus said, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask, who are you? They all knew it was the Lord. This is a post-resurrection appearance, you remember. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. Oh, wow, have you heard that phrase before too? When did that happen? The upper room language. Here's the bread. Take it. And so he said with the fish, this is now the third time that Jesus revealed to the disciples that he was raised from the dead. And I'm almost thinking this is the special trip, right? This is the trip that shouldn't need it to be made for, for Peter. When they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, oh, there it is again. Where's Peter? Come on. This is Peter. No, Simon. Son of John, let's go back to your birth and your childhood. Do you love me more than these? There are at least three ways you can understand that phrase. And I think the interpretation should be pretty simple. Do you love me more than these? Right? That demonstrative pronoun needs an antecedent. These what? Right? Do you love me more than these 153 fish? Do you love me more than this sea? Do you love me more than these nets? I don't think that's the issue, although that's not a bad sermon to preach from another text. We should certainly love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. We ought to love Christ more than anything else. Our jobs, our hobbies. More than these, what do you mean? Do you love me more than these guys? I mean, you went out here with a few of the the apostles. I don't think that's Peter's problem, and I don't think that's what Jesus meant, although that's a good sermon too. You should not love your family, your friends, or even your own children more than you love Christ. I think this harkens back just like everything in this passage. Do you love me more than these guys love me? Do you love me more? Do you have a love for me that's more than these guys? That's exactly how this started. He says it very clear. If everyone else falls away, the parallel passages, Mark 14, Matthew 26, I'm never going to do it. I love you more than these guys love you. Hey, do you love me more than these? You know that I love you and feed my lambs. I won't get into the distinction between agapao and phileo. I know it's dismissed out of hand by most people these days, and it seems like everyone's quoting everyone else, but do a little study on the history there. There's a lot of great linguists in the past that have made a distinction and see a distinction here between phileo and uh, uh, um, agape love, the agape love, agapao. That distinction may or may not be in play. I know it's dismissed as an exegetical fallacy these days. Nevertheless, that was a whole sentence I shouldn't have started, but the point is <laughs> that there's a lot going on in this passage. Some of it's subtle, I believe. Nevertheless, Jesus' answer is clear every time. Feed my sheep. Second time. Do you love me? Next time, he responds, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said, then send my sheep. You got a job to do. Fish for men. He said a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? There he changes from agapao to phileo. And Peter was grieved because he said a third time. Now, was it because of the word? Because it's the third time? Third time certainly rings in our minds. He denied him three times. Nevertheless, three affirmations to say, let's get back on the stage and tell me you love me here again. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Still saying it the way he had throughout this. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. You got work to do. Truly, truly. The same prefix, by the way, that John 14, or John 13, rather, uses regarding the denials. He says, I say to you, lots of connections. 
to our passage, that scene. When you were young, you used to dress yourself, walk wherever you wanted to go. When you're old, you'll stretch out your hands, and other will dress you, carry where you do not want to go. He said this to show what kind of death he was to glorify God. That is really the most bizarre encouragement he could get, right? You're going to be a martyr for me. You're here weakly saying, I don't know if I can be any good. I don't know if I can do anything helpful here. And he said, follow me. Back to the first words of Christ to Simon Peter, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's John following them, uh, following them and the one who'd leaned back against him during the supper and he said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? John's getting in his clear depiction of himself here. Verse 21, when Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what about this man? I mean, if you really, if we all understood in that context, you're talking about a crucifixion or some kind of death. He's going to say, what about him? Jesus said to him, I love this. If it's my will for him to remain until I come, what is that to you? Follow me. Now, we're talking about corporate holiness in the church. We ought to care about it because we're all in a battle. But when it comes down to it this morning and at every other time, you hear the call to holiness in your life. And if you follow the call to get back on the beam and go, man, you got to see it that way. It doesn't matter what anyone else around you is doing. Follow me. So the saying spread among the brothers, and he goes on to talk about the confusion that people got from that statement regarding John and his longevity, which was not what Christ meant. You've got to follow Christ in this turbulent world. We're in a battle. But you've got to put your confidence in the right place. And Jesus was there, a special trip. Trust me, trust me. i got a job for you. Just like it says in that passage we learned as kids, Joshua 1, verse 9, I've commanded you to be strong and courageous. Don't be frightened. Don't be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I will be with you. I think I quoted that last time I was here. The whole string from Moses to Gideon on down. I'll be with you all the way to the Great Commission. Go make disciples of all the nations, right? Baptizing, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey all that I command you. This is going to be your calling. And I will be with you even to the end of your life. No, even to the end of the apostolic age. No, even to the end of the age. We're in that passage. And the Father wants us to walk through our generational difficulties, knowing he'll be with us. Let's go back to that scene in the Valley of Elah for just a second. I can slip you out of the big sandals of the overconfident Philistine, but instead of putting you in the sandals of David, as so many often are prone to do, let's consider that Christ, our perfect warrior king, has defeated the enemy and is gruesome and PG-13 as it is. Verse Samuel 17 says that he went over with he, he unsheathed Goliath's own sword and he cut off his head. And he grabbed that mangy melon of a head by his hair and he hauled it back, back to his tent. And as he stands there with the decapitated head, it's such a scene, right? It's, it's a gross scene, you can imagine. I mean, in our internet different day, perhaps you've seen scenes of, of beheadings. It's horrible. But here's the enemy that was defying the armies of God. The enemy is, is, is dead, I'd like you to put yourself in the sandals of all those Israelites busy munching on cheese and bread that their families had sent them. And all of a sudden, the guy they feared is gone. He's dead. This is a great line. Verse 52 in 1 Samuel 17, And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines. Because the enemy was dead. Now our enemy is like a chicken that gets his head cut off and is still running around. We've got to battle him, I understand. But the cross defeated him, and you and I have an opportunity to live in our lives today until the day you take your last breath, living for the Lord Jesus Christ as someone I hope that has a biblical confidence that you and I, we can live for Christ, we can engage the battle with a shout, and we can pursue our holiness which bats back the gates of hell. There's great strength for frail servants like us we can remember our enemy has been defeated. Thanks for indulging me for an extra few minutes. Let's pray. God, it is a battle for us, and perhaps it was worth spending a little bit of time here in John 21, because I can only think there are some that have wandered into church this morning. There are some guilt-inducing sins right now in their hearts and minds, and right now they need to respond. It only takes a minute, a second, for us to sincerely say to you that our sins are sin, confessing our sin, agreeing with you. 
and that you are faithful, consistent to your promise, and you're just. You're the justifier and the one, the just judge, a righteous one, to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, even if, as we, even if we feel as bad as Peter, weeping over some bitter betrayal in our own lives that we have committed against you, I pray today to be the day we get back on the beam, we get back in the game, we recognize that you want from us a resolve that is biblical and right to be strong and courageous, to be men, to stand up and to say that we're ready to serve you in this world. We want to be holy and we want our church to be holy. And God, I know that the interdependence and the network of relationships in this church, the teachers, the discipling, the counseling that goes on, just the regular encouragement of brothers and sisters, we need one another to strengthen one another. But that means we have to engage this battle. Make us humble in this battle, knowing our weakness, knowing but for the grace of God, we would be another statistic. But we trust in you and our confidence is in the right place. You're praying for us. Your spirit is interceding for us. Thank you, Christ, for that mediatorial work even now. Strengthen us as we face the battle, even starting this afternoon when the temptations come. Let us remember the things we've learned this morning in church. In Jesus' name, amen.